The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. It's a movie about getting animated in France. No, we're not covering Waterloo, it's Thumbelina. What the fuck? Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And we are here to talk today about Don Bluth's Hans Christian Andersen's Thumbelina. So first, let's uh, let, let's get a brief plot synopsis out of the way. Marisha, you want to you want to do that for us? Sure. Thumbelina is a tiny person born from a flower, and she falls in love with a fairy prince, although she doesn't have any wings of her own. She is going to marry him, but then she gets kidnapped by several different animals in succession and taken far away from home, is not able to get home, is not able to find her prince until finally, at the end, she does. Not that many what-the-fuck moments, but we have a couple. I'll, I'll, I'll start here. Uh, an example of really bad parenting. She nearly gets baked in a pie. There is a ridiculously sexualized female frog complete with plastic tits. And this is a what-the-fuck moment that shows up in many films. Whenever someone gets into a, 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 an object like a canoe, or in this case, I, I believe, a leaf on a river, sudden waterfalls appear that no one has noticed up to that point. That's more a what-the-trope, I guess, if you will. Hmm. The animation here, unlike uh, Snow White Happily Ever After, <laughs> Happily Ever After very lush, beautiful looking animation throughout this entire film, I thought. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was quite lovely. Out of the animated stuff that we've done, definitely the best uh, best looking film uh, that we've done. The second place I want to go. So, you know, now we've got the good out of the way. This uh, the second place, oh no, and and Gilbert Gottfried is in it. So, now we've yes. got the good out of the way. <laughs> Something that I thought was interesting about this movie is that it is almost an anti-romance, if you will, because Romance movies are almost always the formula of, you know, boy meets girl, boy gets girl, complications ensue in the relationship between them. Right. And and then they have to resolve it. In this, it's literally she meets a winged man who comes in through her window, starts cutting up her shit, and she's like, I'm in love. <laughs> They're just totally fine throughout the movie. There is never once anything between them that is problematic but they don't actually interact much for most of the movie like they they fall in love at the very beginning and then through most of the movie they're trying to find each other or they're getting you know kidnapped or they're being trapped in ice or they're you know whatever but yeah they you, so you're right it's i wouldn't call it a romance for sure yet it does end in a very romance sort of way they they yes. get married and 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 we literally have the book close and or the the we pull back so that we're looking at the book again uh because it's all like some fucking mouse or some shit telling a fairy tale story and it says and they live happily ever after which what was that it was the bird telling the story <laughs> i thought there's so many goddamn animals in this i know that gilbert godfrey was a beetle everybody else can kiss my ass the um <laughs> Oh, and Carol Channing was a field mouse. I remember that. But yeah, and John Hurt was a mole. I caught those in the end credits. So anyway, uh, it's 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 interesting in that it's not a typical romance. I think the only other film that I can remember that is ostensibly a romance in which there is no tension between the two romantic partners is in fact true romance, uh, which was my favorite romance for a very long time as a kid, uh, because what kid doesn't love seeing an Arquette beat a man to death with a shotgun? I haven't seen that movie. I Really? Yeah, actually, I'm not a fan of romances in general, so like, I'm totally glad that this you know, didn't fit that formula. It didn't really fit any formula. It's kind of also the anti-hustle and flow. One of those movies where somebody is kind of in the middle of nowhere and they dream of becoming a star and that's the goal. Because that reminds it's like, me of Chicago or something. Sure, allegedly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that kind of... Because in this, like literally Thumbelina, everybody she meets is trying to make her a fucking star. Like she yeah. can't get away from the stardom, the life of being a star. Yeah, it was an interesting theme to the movie. That's, that's certainly true. 
she recognizes that the musician's life is is one of fickle fame and fortune and ups and downs, yet everybody just keeps thrusting her on stage or thrusting their hips at her. Right. And she like she seems to enjoy performing and she takes to it, but uh yeah, it's it's not actually part of her character. It's part of like it's everyone trying to get her to do that. She's always game to try to learn dance steps and everything. Yeah, That's, yeah. I, I I really kind of enjoyed that about her character that she was just like, well, okay, some over sexualized frogs kidnap me. I guess I gotta put on a show. Better at learn the steps. At some point, I really want to talk about the scene at the at the Beetle Ballroom because that was actually kind of an intense scene. That was a. There are a couple of points in this movie where it randomly out of the blue goes pretty dark. Yeah, like she. I, it, I mean, if we want to talk about it now, go for it. Sure. She, Though, here, I will say this first. Gilbert Gottfried is in that scene fucking doing a Jimmy Durante number. So, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this so this insect, this Gilbert Gottfried character kidnaps her and, and takes her, because she's, like, beautiful, like, he loves her, takes her to the the beetle ballroom where she's in this magnificent gown like this actual this costume is actually like really really cool where she's dressed up like a beetle but as she's on stage and on performing her dress gets like torn off of her like underneath she's not naked but she's like everyone can see her body and at first she doesn't realize anything's wrong and she's singing and dancing and she's having a good time then she realizes that the audience is jeering at her cuz she's she's not insect shaped she's human shaped and she's so ugly and like the just watching the crumble of this of her clothes getting torn off of her and then like this like all the jeers and everything like it was, it was kind of an intense scene i thought i i think the crux of the scene for me the one the moment where i was like whoa this is kind of upsetting is where she stops and for a moment says i'm ugly yeah like she's never even considered the concept before and because she grew up on the farm <laughs> with no one of her like the only other human even regular sized human that she ever interacted with was her mother mm -hmm. and 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 so you know no one has just ever really commented on her physical appearance i mean even the prince when they fall in love through one song i don't think he ever like comments on her beauty it's just like hey we're the same size we could fuck and that's like it right yeah and i actually i kind of like that about the movie because in like other animated movies like beauty and the beast like her name is beauty she's beautiful uh snow white she's the fairest in the land like all these all these different characters they're part of their characterization is their beauty with Thumbelina, she's very much desired, but it's not actually comment like her beauty itself isn't actually commented on until she gets called ugly. That's true. I I I, I believe. I don't know. I was I was kind of in a <laughs> comatose stupor for most of this movie. <laughs> I just kept screaming, "Shut the fuck up!" and throwing things because every five seconds a song would start, and it was like it was really pretty song heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Can we not get five minutes of talking? And and the answer was no. Don Bluth was like. I want to make you cry, Michael. I want to make you cry tears of blood and pain. And the thing that I thought was weird about that scene, beyond the fact that it was, I mean, it was very adult in the way that they handled her self-image, I thought. But beyond that, I was confused as to why the Beatle, Gilbert Gottfried, was, wanted to put her in the show in the first place since he... You know, I mean, he just seemed to have no definition of beauty because he was like, oh, I guess you're ugly. Y yeah, like after after they call her ugly, he's like, oh, yeah, I guess you are. But before that, like he, he was all sorts of lavishing praise on her. So it's, I mean, they're insects. Who knows? Maybe they're just really alien and weird. <laughs> I guess that could be, but he he seemed fairly human in a lot of ways. But I and I gotta say he kept calling her toots, which I love. <laughs> hey toots, let's go, let's go make some music together. <laughs> uh, the uh, the other scene that I thought was really intense, and I'm curious uh, to get your thoughts on this scene is. She gets kidnapped by Carol Channing, the field mouse, and they go take corn cakes to Mr. Mole. And I love the way that Carol Channing's character is written as just this doddering old fucking like crazy field mouse. Because she's like, oh, uh, you know, it's so sad that Prince Cornelius of the Fairies died. And Thumbelina's like, oh, fuck, that's my fiancé. He's dead? And she's like, yeah, anyway, fuck your grief. <laughs> Mr. Mole needs his corn cakes. Shut the fuck up, whore. Get those corn cakes. <laughs> she really and was, like, just incredibly detached because she... 
when Thumbelina's heart was absolutely breaking, this mouse is like, oh, that's that's very sad. And then and then later she's like, oh, I love love stories. But then she sings an entire song about how love doesn't matter. So I don't know. It's She's a strange character. And she has lived God only knows how long in this tunnel caring for Mr. Mole, taking him corn cakes and everything. And... He's obviously interested in marriage because he says to her, you know how I've talked about the fact that I, I'm thinking of getting married. And I really thought when he said, would you help me get Thumbelina's hand, that she would be like, "Rumpf," you know, she would be pissed off. Yeah. And she was just like, oh, yeah, sure. She kind of slaves for this mole, too, because she all she can think about is bringing him corn cakes and finding him a wife and like doing all this stuff for him. Maybe on the cutting room floor is that she's some kind of, you know, poly sub slut of his <laughs> blah 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 blah. i'm sure that could have happened right sure and, and it's not that like it's a mole and a field mouse so there's like some sort of weird miscegenation or or whatever going on there because obviously the mole's okay with being married with to a, a woman tiny little human yeah but so anyway as as weird as that scene is it's still not completely as dark as i think the point where thumbelina sees giacomo her friendly bird who uh, was looking for the veil of the fairies for her, and she thinks he's dead which Giacomo is actually a swallow and I wrote down that I want a swallow of great passion <laughs> <laughs> I, I really liked this character actually although he was kind of stupid through some of it because at one point like, all Thumbelina is doing is trying to get home, and the bird wants to help her and wants to help her get married to the prince, but he just flies away and leaves her in the wilderness all winter long instead of flying her home. And then at the end, when they realize the prince is alive and everything is fixed, he flies her completely away from that. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the movie could have been them like landing in fucking Liechtenstein and him being like oh here we are boy this is that's the way the movie starts is with a drunk swallow in a god awful Christmas sweater speaking English in France yeah Giacomo <laughs> But so anyway, so so she's looking at what she thinks is his corpse, and I think she quickly realizes that he's alive. But still, she's looking at at, at what what appears to be his his corpse, and she goes and approaches it, and she starts talking about maybe I should marry the mole. I guess he could provide for me. And this possibly hit a little close to home for me because I I actually have two close friends right now who are women nearing their late twenties, and they are in relationships where they are not extremely fulfilled but they're like well i'm i'm well taken care of and so maybe i should just soldier through you know and it's like is is the the chance of going out on my own again and being single at like 29 or whatever is you know that versus never really being happy in my romantic life uh what's that worth and so you know, how do I weigh those two things on scales? And I just, so for me, that really hit home because of things that friends of mine are going through. I was curious, did did it feel as momentous to you or? It didn't, but I all, also already knew how it was going to turn out because I've seen the movie before. So I... Oh, well, well I knew she wasn't going to marry the mole, but still just having that moment. I thought it was an, an interesting, like she only decides to marry the mole like in her deepest moments of despair like when she has no hope left that she's ever going to do anything that's when she's going to settle down to a, a loveless marriage or whatever and that, i mean that kind of that's mirrored in real life as well i mean that's the story of women over how many how many years like that you know hundreds of years seven or eight no i don't i don't know <laughs> <clears throat> I mean that's that's such a common thing like that's that's a thing like that that is a that is a thing throughout like just in real life so much that it didn't really surprise me. Sure certainly but I I I don't think it's something that's ever uh, necessarily brought up in kids romance fantasy movies. Yeah possibly uh, not and certainly not sung songs about so explicitly by little mice. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not though maybe 
That wedding, though, because she does almost go through with the Mr. Mole wedding. I mean, I mean, she basically does go through with it, like, 95%. And I honestly thought they were going to go for a graduate ending, <laughs> which they almost do. Except then Giacomo just flies her away from everything that's happening, and so they can't quite do it. She decides at the very last second not to marry, and then she escapes and finds the sunlight, and that, like, feels really good to her. But then, but then she just still doesn't know how to get home, and I, I guess that's when... Giacomo finds her. Yeah, and he's like, hey, let's go home! And she's like, no, but my fiancé is a liar. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm on this fucking swallow again. <laughs> I gotta say about that wedding, that was like the best bridal pigtail ever. <laughs> yeah, her outfits throughout the show, I gotta say, they're they're quite, I like them quite a lot. Like, they were, they were pretty cool costumes. They definitely made her look hot, which was... A little creepy, but I, I guess kind of cool. I don't know. Um, and and the, the outfits definitely reflected that. But speaking of people who looked hot, I know you had some issues with the frogs I, in this yeah, movie. Yeah, the, fro the frogs, I mean, they were, so, I mean, they were kind of cute. But the, but the female frog was just, I could not get over her appearance. Like, she had these gigantic lips and this really sexualized body. And, like, her breasts, like, bouncing everywhere was just really distracting for this... <laughs> children's movie but she is singing about how they're gonna they're gonna make money being performers and i guess that's what this frog has dedicated her life to so i actually wrote down is this racism or just madness because the over sexualized mother and the lascivious mother obsessed toad children are all presented as ridiculous spanish stereotypes yeah but i was like I, I don't think Spaniards are ever compared to frogs, and I don't think they're ever, like, you know, overly sexualized. I mean, you know, I, I guess, like, they're they're often found hot or whatever, but, I mean, this doesn't seem like a racist caricature, but I really thought that Don Bluth was, like, like in many storyboard notes, must have written, like, never trust the filthy Spanish. <laughs> Because it really felt like the Spanish were the bad guys. And I was thinking, like, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'm sure France, France and Spain went to war at some goddamn point. But, I mean, was this tapping into some deep-seated French-Spanish, you know, fear of them raping our women or whatever? Or... Yeah, I really don't know. <laughs> Because I just, I was like, this is supposed to be France. Why are there Spanish sexualized frogs who sing? <laughs> So bizarre. So, so strange. Yet, Gilbert Gottfried is a lascivious beetle fit in completely well. Right, I mean, and just... he teams up with the frog, and, and they both try to kill the prince together, and they end up freezing him in the... Or I guess they didn't do that, but did you notice how fast winter set in? One second it was autumn, and the next second the the river was freezing solid with, with too fast for the prince to escape. The whole what season it was bullshit was really confusing to me, because A... Like, everybody was so worried about winter coming, and I'm like, none of these characters are, like, six months old, except maybe some of the little little bug kids or jitterbugs who were very similar to the little kids in Robin Hood. I actually kind of like them because of that, because it made me think of, like, May Marion, are you gonna marry Robin Hood? <laughs> you know, so I'm like, they've all lived through a winter before. Why is everybody flip? Like, it felt like Game of Thrones there for a bit. It was like, <laughs> winter is coming, beware. And I'm like, guys, you're, you're fucking animals, you know? Like, like you, you, you figure this shit out. And then the fairy parents who are apparently in charge of the seasons changing like but not like really because they can only like yeah. they could hold it off for a little while but they couldn't stop it from happening so the fairy prince is like mom dad you guys hold off the autumn chill because i gotta find her and, th and then after he goes they're like uh we can only hold it off for like one day and then it's months later where winter sets in and we care you know because it's like well why did we care about it changing to autumn why did you care about holding that back when you still kept hunting through all of autumn and then yeah winter sets in and an entire pond freezes in seconds and i remember i was actually i my breath kind of caught because i was like holy shit they killed the prince <laughs> it did look like i mean he really should have been dead but i guess it was like some sort of cryogenic thing he was very spry for having been in a cryogenic coma for like yeah three months at that point i was like but he's magic he's a fairy so you never know <laughs> 
he should have just been um, twitching in a bed in traction for like six months yeah. and then found Thumbelina married and blah, 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 blah. Let's talk more about their love story and giant air quotes there. He finds her and they begin singing and he flies her up into the sky and they wander around. I can't even remember what the hell they were singing about. But, like, right before that, she goes to bed with a book full of stories about fairies. And, like, <laughs> one of the most sexually charged moments in the film where she's like, Mom, I just want to take the book to bed and look at the pictures before, uh, before I go to sleep. And I was like, I know what that's about. <laughs> it's a metaphor. And then the fairy prince sees her, you know, which is like a really good coincidence there. And he comes in and cuts out the picture of the fairy prince and then like puts himself in and he's like, hey, rockin'. And they sing for a while and then they're in love for the rest of the movie. And, and I thought it was interesting, like, I was really curious, is there an entire fairy race out there? And he chose her over thousands of other similarly sized winged women in that Well, that kingdom. brings up the question, too, of, of her. Like, what what is she? Like, why doesn't why is she so tiny, but she doesn't have any wings? Like, is there a race of tiny people that don't have wings out there? Her whole background, which is an old woman in a farm asked a witch for a child, so she gave her some barley corn. She planted the barley corn and out spouted a rose, uh, the petal of which... In, in the middle of the petals was Thumbelina, fully grown. Which, whenever I have an underage girl in my bed, that is the excuse <laughs> I always give. I swear, officer, I planted some barley corn. And I just, you know, this came out, I gotta take care of her. What are you gonna do? Parents, I was lied to. Yeah, and then she grows up there and uh, everybody sings to her about her physical deformities and it's funny. Uh, and <laughs> the mother has the book about fairies, yet doesn't seem to know that fairies exist. I, I really wonder, are fairies a dying race in this world? Because ever, nobody seemed to know where the veil of the fairies was, even though everybody knew that, like, the fucking Spanish frogs were a threat and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, right? like, Giacomo spends most of the movie looking for the veil of the fairies. You know what I thought was interesting, too, though? Like, you mentioned how the love story between Thumbelina and the prince, like, never really happens, but the, the kind of interactions that I think should have taken place between them actually took place between Thumbelina and Giacomo. Like, if you look at their right. story, like, there's actually a lot of development of their friendship that if it were the prince, in, you know, doing that, it would have been the romance story. So I think they just, like, split that guy up into two characters or something just for convenience. Definitely. I, I remember the scene where I most felt that was where she falls asleep on Giacomo because she's cold and exhausted and he's going to sleep anyway and they they fall to sleep together and it's like they they have this uh intense bond and i just i was like you know if this were like a, a sitcom now the prince would fly along see them sleeping together and be like oh shit she done left me or whatever you know yeah and, um, that would have introduced some drama <laughs> but instead they they eventually wake up i mean that's really as far as it goes but it did feel like there's there's more there except that giacomo is incredibly sexless i guess he's not yeah as... i guess so like like uh, the mouse i guess yeah that's true i guess um many of the you know to be fair we don't know if the mole is marrying her in the hopes of like he might have no ulterior motives he just likes her singing right right and you know even the beatles find her ugly too maybe no one in this movie actually finds her attractive <laughs> I, I guess except for the prince yeah except for the prince who uh, it seems a little daft he, he <laughs> might not get what a wife entails you know <laughs> yeah who knows for... maybe in the veil of the fairies they do things a different way even so maybe this is an entirely different movie than we're even thinking right maybe his parents just planted some barley corn yeah and cornelius came out um <laughs> although he has wings and she doesn't until the end randomly yeah like again it wasn't clear why she got them did she get them because she like found her true self or was it just because like she got married to him and kissed him and oh now she's got her own wings or like was it yeah they didn't explain it at all right like like wings are an std you contract from <laughs> a fairy yeah 
this this is when was this movie made this was probably some it was like don't trust the spanish or the gays <laughs> that was the that was the subtext of this film except that oh. i mean wings seem pretty desirable true like if i have to kiss a fairy to get those that would that'd be all right <laughs> <laughs> even even the beetle wanted wings. Oh yeah, because his got ripped off by the frog who he was helping out in the first place. Right, and I thought uh, they're ripped off, dude. What are you gonna do if he gives him back to you? They're they're not gonna operate anymore. Yeah, but he doesn't know that. I guess <laughs> <laughs> it didn't seem to bother him that physically either. Yeah, I guess not. The scene that has their song in it. That whole scene, did you notice that she appears to get hypothermia during that scene? Like, she's very red colored through the entire thing because of her hair, and she's very often wearing red. And in that scene, she's colored so that she's blue, blue, blue when she's up flying high, which I was like, that's very realistic, but she's gonna die. <laughs> but I I guess she didn't. I, did, I didn't really pay attention to the colors. Where, where were your eyes? Were they on the fairy prince's masculine wings? Yeah, and that wonderful outfit of his that was actually, like, her, you know, Thumbelina's outfits were wonderful. His was just kind of hideous. I think my favorite line in this movie was the one that started with, Pon talk say. <laughs> like, I just love that as an idea that there's pawn talk. You know? Oh, yeah. Like the huggy bear of the of the uh, of the show lets us know pawn talk say this is gonna happen. And then there were there were cops too that were the pond patrol. Were there? Yeah, supposedly. Although I mean, we never see them. But someone, I think it's the beetle threatens the frog that he's gonna call the pond patrol on him. Maybe that's why I was thinking later because uh, when the sudden waterfall appears, there are two fish who suddenly become very concerned and and go to try to save her. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Is this what Fish Police was a spinoff of? <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice uh, the fish had a cute little, like they had a clothesline with, with clothes drying on it under the water? I, I thought that was cute and silly. Yeah, I was very confused by the physics there. <laughs> this is one of the few animated movies, I think, ever where dogs are useless. Yeah, the, the dog, he acts... Like, he's guarding the place, and then he doesn't do anything to prevent Thumbelina getting kidnapped. Yeah, he, he should have had some more practice drills, like, in place for dealing with Thumbelina theft, which, I that was, like, his sole purpose in life. Why was the dog bald, too? Did you see that? Like, he had this ugly bald head. I only first noticed it after he had failed to save her, and so I thought maybe in all that crazy-ass scene where he's going in between things that there was some spot where he had had his hair ripped off but uh, no was i don't, it there I don't think so I, I think it was from like that from the beginning then yeah because i was like i guess they're trying to show that he's bald but it looks like somebody put a condom on his head <laughs> kind of also another theme in this movie fuck gps just follow your heart and i love how <laughs> I love how as Thumbelina is like wrapping herself in a dirty sock on a tree branch somewhere, she's like, that follow your heart shit doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had a Tom Tom or something. Jesus. She gets consumed by despair a couple of times throughout the movie and it's and then usually the advice is, Oh, just follow your heart again and it's fine. I, and I guess everything does work out well for her in the end, so maybe it's supposed to be true. I I don't know. I I'm I'm still uh, I'm still pretty skeptical. It felt I don't want to say it was bad. It was only bad because we had to endure a reprise of the worst song in the movie, but I hated when we went back to see her mom because somebody's like, "Oh, I hope her mom's okay or whatever." And we see her mom and Hero the useless dog, and they're singing about her and they're really sad that she's gone, and I was just like did we need to see this, you know? Did did we need another song from the mother? Yeah, I guess they wanted to make the mother more of a character in the story, but she didn't exactly have a role to play other than planting the barley corn. Just plant some more barley corn and shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's, it's shocking to me how god-awfully easy love is when you're two inches tall. Like, I, I mean, you just, you know, you see someone and you're like, hey, awesome, let's fall in love and possibly fuck though that's you know nebulous as we've talked about <laughs> right well I, I guess it's easy unless unless you get kidnapped and and thrown around from person to person who's also presumably loving you but uh, who knows maybe we should marry them all yeah it's it's really it, it's a good metaphor i think for all of life 
I'm going to use that with my friends who are going through a bit of a midlife crisis or whatever right now. I'm just going to say, well, maybe you should just marry the mole. <laughs> so, Marisha, I think that brings us to what would you do to make this film better? Let's see. I, I think I would have gone with more uh, drama regarding the bird. I liked, I liked the interaction between Thumbelina and the bird. I like our idea of having there some, some sort of uh, love triangle with the prince and the bird and Thumbelina. I think that would have made for some good drama. Okay, though I'll say the thing that I absolutely hate the most in, in, in like everything, because I myself am, am Polly, is I hate love triangles because I'm always like, why can't they just be all happy together? Well, hey, that could, that I, I definitely agree. So that could have been a, a good ending too if they were to go in that direction. But, it, you know, right. you instead of a love... introduce that some sort of conflict. Yeah, instead of, instead of a love triangle, a love triad. There we go, yes. <laughs> it's interesting. Giacomo in this was kind of similar to the um, hooded freak character in Snow White Happily Ever After in the yeah. sense that if in Snow White Happily Ever After uh, the, the prince were actually someone else rather than being that character, there would be a bit of a like, oh shit moment, you know, when it's like, I love two people, now I have to choose or whatever. And in this, it's just never really an issue because Giacomo is just oblivious. Yeah, but they do they do spend time like having the two interact as characters as you know, and developing their friendship while the prince is missing. So yeah, that's a very interesting parallel. So to fix this movie, m my answer is very, very simple. Shut the fuck up, people. Just stop fucking singing. Oh my <laughs> god, do I hate fucking musicals. But what I think would make it even better, because that would be tough to do. This movie's like 20 something years old at this point and we really can't go back and change that but what i think would be even better is if we had a sequel in which gilbert godfrey the beetle realizes his old wings won't fit back on and he sees that thumbelina kissed a fairy and she got wings so it's his <laughs> quest to find a fairy prince to kiss and get wings of his own. I love that story. That would be an excellent sequel. I think that would be awesome. And he just randomly tries to put anyone and anything into show business. You know, it's like he finds like a, I don't know, a, a rotting otter corpse. And he's like, hey, Toots, you want to be in show business? <laughs> I mean, we basically got a pitch. We're pitch ready with this. God damn it, Disney. Give us a call. <laughs> All right. Uh, until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, or anything, th this is available on YouTube as well. Uh, just search Thumbelina, maybe Don Bluth, um, and, and you should be able to find it pretty quickly. And I'll, I'll try to put it on the website. And speaking of the website, drop us a line if you have any sort of feedback. Info at isonmars.net. Uh, until next time. Bye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars.